Hey, everybody, and welcome to Intelligence Squared. I'm John Donvan. And today we're debating something that doesn't exist yet. And we're going to be asking whether it should eventually exist. And so here is the question we are putting up for debate. Do we need a digital dollar? Okay, so maybe this is not one you've heard argued before because of that non-existence factor and also because it may not be entirely clear what a digital dollar is supposed to be. So before we actually get to the debate, we are going to do something different this time and we're going to ask our two debaters not to argue just yet, but to help explain and lay down some understanding of what the term digital dollar means. So let's welcome Dante Desparte, who is Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy for Circle, and that is a financial services firm that works in private digital currencies. Dante, welcome to Intelligence Squared. It's great to have you. Thank you, John. Great to be here. And Jillian Tett, who is Chair of the Editorial Board and U.S. Editor-at-Large of the Financial Times. Jillian, you have joined us and debated a bunch of times before, so this is definitely a welcome back to you. I'm delighted to be on the show, particularly with someone like Dante. <laughs> so we're going to try asking the two of you to hold back on the arguments and help us understand this term digital dollar. Dante, I'll go to you first. And I think the way I want to ask you is, what is a digital dollar not? Right. Well, I mean, we could start with what it is not. It is not currently in broad circulation. It is a conceptual framework um, born and accelerated at, at some level in 2019, where central banks around the world responded to two fears. One was the fear of big tech entering the payments and money movement system, and the other is the fear of China tech. And so the, the clearest definition of what a digital dollar would be is a digital dollar issued by a central bank, in the case of the United States, obviously the Fed, or in other countries, their central banks, that could exist at a retail level Um, And that would be supported over uh, the internet or other sort of technologies for transmission uh, in the same way that you and I enjoy the transmission of physical money today. So so that that would be like the strictest definition is is issued by a central bank and as a part of the retail payment system. Jillian, do you see it the same way or any quibbles with that definition? Um, I broadly see it the same way. I mean, a dollar is basically a currency created by the Federal Reserve um, Central Bank. Um, But I would add something else to it, which is, to me, the easiest way to imagine it is to think about digital tokens. And the easiest way to imagine a digital token, which sounds abstract, is to imagine your phone taking a photograph of a friend. And that photograph is not your friend, but it's a token of your friend. And you can send that picture across the airwaves wherever you want, whenever you want. And so in some ways, what a digital dollar is, is a cyber snapshot, a token representing a dollar created by a central bank that can be zipped around the world anywhere you want on your phone or internet or any other cyber link you have. And in what way is that different from the experience many people have now of already moving dollars around with their phones using things like um, Venmo and Zelle? Well, that's a really good question. And it comes down to essentially to who is actually creating the currency, what kind of control you actually have over that currency, whether it sits in the central uh, central hands of a central bank or not. Um, one of the points to make about um, digital dollars and many aspects of digital aspects is that it's not necessarily a complete step change about how, what we have already, but it is a significant shift. And there's one other thing that's really important to stress about this, which is that when people talk about digital dollars, they often mean the digital currencies created by central banks. Um, However, they can also be, under some definitions, created by private sector institutions if there are other dollars backing or other dollar assets backing what they're creating. So there are some companies, um, you know, which are essentially creating quasi-digital dollars, but backed by real dollars as well. And are we talking, um, Dante, about this the digital dollar being a new currency, or is it another variation of the dollar with, that we know in the sense that there are paper dollars and there are electronic dollars, or is it a, is it a new currency? Well, what would make it new and unique is the marriage of the preservation of privacy, the marriage of the ability to have censorship-resistant transactions, and peer-to-peer transactions with the internet. And and that's where I think the concept of a digital dollar becomes boundary destroying when you think about, you know, traditional money and regulation um, and the role of central banking is that 
at some level, the fact that, as Jillian described it, that, that because of an internet native form, it has the superpowers of the internet and the transmissibility of the internet, at some levels, it stops respecting the traditional four walls of banking and payments and monetary policy. So in that sense, it would be distinct, but it would also potentially represent a liability on a central bank as a guarantor or a supplier of last resort and an expression of monetary policy, despite the fact that it would have this transmissibility in, in a, a digitally native manner. And the last thing I want to ask you is a digital dollar is not a cryptocurrency, or is it? Well, again, at the moment, the field is moving so fast that language tends to be quite ambiguous and it's often a spectrum and a single word can mean several things. But I'd go back to this idea again of taking of a token, of taking a snapshot of your friend and then sending it somewhere else. Now, you've only got one friend who actually exists in the real life. If you take a photograph and frame it in the traditional way and put it on the wall, then you actually have a limited quantities of photographs. If you start zipping that photograph back and forth a gazillion times and potentially altering it, and if the power to do that yourself on your phone, then essentially you're losing control of that friend image. And so one of the key questions at the heart of all this is, what is the mechanism to control the supply of that token? Is it in the hands of a central bank who says, actually, I want to know every single token that's out there and control it, or at least have a control over the supply. And that's kind of what happens right now with dollars when a central bank actually creates currency and dollars. They control the supply overall to a degree. You can argue about whether commercial banks can create more dollars or not, but that's roughly the broad idea. When you get into a world of truly digital currencies, essentially it's the individual armed with a computer who starts creating the currencies and the real question is, is there a limit to that creation of currencies or not? Is it done through clever algorithms and the way that, say, Bitcoin is, mining of the currencies and tokens? Or is there something else which controls it? And to what degree does it still sit in a central bank or individuals? And Dante, I, I was going to ask you the same question, is it a cryptocurrency? But I, I sense that you agree with most of uh, Jillian's description, but I think to help the general audience again... I'll put it this way. How is a digital dollar not the same thing as Bitcoin? Well, a digital dollar would not be the same thing as Bitcoin, despite the fact that notionally it may leverage many of the same technologies. And so one of the technologies that a digital dollar would ostensibly leverage is um, blockchain-based ledgering. And so uh, public blockchain infrastructure like Bitcoins, and there are many others, are, have solved one of the accounting world's most vexing challenges, which is the double spend challenge. And so in Jillian's example, if she has uh, sent that image to me or that digital currency to me, in a world in which that's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, it has to be final and it has to have recorded the debits and credits in, in, in a transparent manner so that the transaction is completely settled. With physical cash today, um, because of the, the, the opacity of how physical cash may be transacted, um, we have all kinds of instances of fraud and abuse and, and uh, differences of opinion where it ends up becoming my word against Jillian's if, in fact, no one else saw us exchange the money. The idea of digital currencies and blockchain-based financial services is that anyone armed with an internet looking glass as small as a phone or as large as a computer, is a part of that collective witness that can verify that transactions actually took place. So that's very a very unique property, which gives digital currencies and cryptocurrencies cash-like transmissibility uh, and transparency. All right. I hope that was helpful for, for our listeners. Um, and thank you very much for in, in, in indulging me and us in that explanation without actually debating yet. And I don't think that either of you gave away which side of the question you're on. So that was uh, that's a neat trick. So let's find out on that one. On the question, do we need a digital dollar? Jillian Ted, are you a yes or a no? I am a yes, and I'll explain why in a few moments. All right, so obviously that means, Dante, you are? I, I, I'm in the um, formidable task of being a no and, and being on the opposite <laughs> side of Jillian on this one. <laughs> All right, let's get to the arguments then. And Jillian, why don't you go first and tell us why you're a yes in answer to the question, do we need a digital dollar? Well, I should start off by saying there's two forms of digital dollars, and I do want to stress this. There is central bank digital dollars, which is entirely controlled, created, and run by central banks. Um, and there's also the other concept of the digital dollar, which is companies, a bit like Circle, who are essentially creating 
quasi dollars, which are tokens that are backed by their holdings of real dollars or real short term money market instruments. So you can define it both ways. Um, I think the second, second, um, second version definitely has a reason to exist. And I'm sure Dante would agree with that as well, because essentially what a digital dollar that's created by a company like Circle or a token backed by real life dollars is doing, it is essentially creating a new element of portability, fungibility to dollars around the world for companies or consumers who want to make transactions and to do so without going inside the pipes of a central bank necessarily in a rather clunky way. So that's a kind of private sector version of it. The public sector version, the central bank version of that um, is different. That's really the central bank itself creating ledgers and running ledgers. And the reason why I think we need that is really twofold. Firstly, for the simple fact that we live in an era of extraordinary technological change and experimentation. And we do not know where that technology um, experimentation is going. Um, maybe it will just fizzle out. Maybe it'll turn out that existing computer ledgers, um, or rather the kind of blockchain ledgers, are just too darn clunky to ever be much use. At the moment, blockchain is quite clunky. You can't make many payments. Or maybe it's going to accelerate dramatically, and quite soon, it'll be so efficient that everyone uses it. We don't know. But I think that central banks have to have skin in the game and be practicing and developing it so that they can keep up with the rest of the world. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, we live in a time of extraordinary geopolitical flux. China has been very upfront about the fact that it wants to try and compete with a dollar with its own currency. There are other countries that are likely to try and do so as well. And if the US does not get into this game now by experimenting and creating a digital dollar under some conditions, then it's going to find potentially that it will get outmaneuvered and out arbitraged by other countries like China. I'm John Donvan. This is Intelligence Squared US. More of our conversation when we return. Welcome back to Intelligence Squared US. Let's get back to our debate. Dante, what's your argument for saying no in answer to the question, do we need a digital dollar? Yeah, I mean, my, my argument for saying no at one level begins with acknowledging, I think, as uh, Jillian rightly summarized, the, the current state of play in the geopolitical reality. So just to add a little bit of context to that, um, today, uh, you know, the Atlantic Council Geoeconomic Center tracks this very closely, something like 105 central banks representing 95 percent of the world's GDP are at some degree of experimentation study on the risks and merits of what are known as central bank digital currencies. And to be clear, that is the variant of digital currencies that I'm opposed to um, in no small measure because I think they fail to acknowledge how money moves today. And so on the score of central bank digital currencies, I'm a resounding no. And on the score of the societal temptation to potentially have a big red button in a centralized authority that could ostensibly deplatform people from their money, where the air gap between the central bank, your wallet, and how you spend money is a feature, not a bug, um, I think is a temptation too risky. The other point is to acknowledge the fact that the, the vast majority of value-added money in circulation today stems from some degree of rules-based private sector innovation and competition. The two-tiered banking system, the fractional reserve banking system, breakthrough innovations on moving money, whether in physical form or in paper form or in cryptographic form, um, all are responsive to public-private um, oversight and rules-based competition. And so the fears of big tech entering the, the, the money movement domain and candidly keeping up with China and the People's Bank of China's efforts, which were unveiled at uh, the Winter Olympics in Beijing recently and um, are effectively a move towards a model of currency uh, and, a, and a model of currency movement that I think have some pretty big boundaries around them vis-a-vis -vis privacy, vis-a-vis -vis, um, continuous innovation in the financial and private sector. Um, I don't think that's an operating model that has served uh, any country very well for a very long period of time. And so some folks analogize this to a digital currency space race. And so then it is worth hearkening back to the original space race. 
that we we won it, so-called we, the West, won it when our political leaders gave us a destination. And then we ultimately marshaled a societal approach that ended up creating innovations that benefit society, humanity, markets, but were nonetheless responsive to a set of rules. And so when you think about some of the challenges that central bank digital currencies represent, You've seen studies coming out of Europe that have indicated that a digital euro would put downward pressure on euro deposits because it would be construed as a safer economic asset in the European Union. This is one of the reasons why central banks have always put out uh, the concept of having balance limits on central bank digital currencies if they were in circulation. The same also holds true in the Chinese experiment. Um, And then it would, again, dismiss the idea that in the 21st century, where your and my financial needs do not take banking holidays, how do you then have an operating model where the central bank becomes a retail bank? Um, And so in the most extreme, that operating model, in my mind, would, would pretty fundamentally transform the typically invisible hands of central bankers and turn them into uh, competitors with high street banking and retail banking. And so, so that's the version of this innovation that I'm, uh, I'm allergic to, and I think we should have hard societal questions. The last quick point I would make is the UK parliament studied this in a parliamentary inquiry not long ago and came out on the side of this may w- very well be a solution looking for a problem that ignores the rules-based free market innovations that are uh, currently taking place and are responsive to uh, regulatory clarity. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Dante. So so Jillian laid out two kinds of digital dollars, the central bank uh, digital dollar. In this case, it would be created by the Fed in the case of the United States versus the quasi-dollars that uh, companies are creating. And it seems as though you don't disagree over the quasi-dollars. So let's dig in on the central bank digital dollar model. And Jillian, I I have a question or two for you, but before I got to them, was there anything that you heard from Dante that you would want to respond to off the bat? Um, I think the main thing I'd like to respond to is this, and I can't stress this strongly enough. You know, we are at a very early stage of innovation and development. It's a bit like the early stage of the internet and people saying, you know, I can't imagine why you'd want to use the internet because it's very slow and clunky. You know, in the early days of the internet, if you had an email address, you know, it was a whole string of numbers. No one really liked using it. You couldn't guarantee it would work. Um, and it was very easy to just turn around and say, oh, it's ridiculous. Let's just get out of this. But actually, we now know that the technology evolved much more rapidly than we expected. And I am probably sharing Dante's um, concerns about privacy issues. You know, if you have a true ledger that's run by a central bank in terms of recording monetary activities, it means the central bank can eventually end up knowing everything you're doing. And that kind of privacy intrusion is something that, you know, essentially the central bank in China is trying to aim for. It's something most Western com- companies and consumers would probably hate. However, this is the however bit. I didn't see anything wrong with the Fed essentially trying to introduce this alongside the current system or as an adjunct to the current system and letting consumers, i.e. the market, decide if some people want to try and use that kind of finance to, again, as I said before, keep skin in the game and keep essentially involved in this fast-moving technology. Jillian, and what what would be the consequence of, in a sense, losing to China in that competition? If if China were to succeed in creating a digital currency that effectively, I think you might be saying, displaces the U.S. dollar as the uh, international standard, what would be the consequences of that? And are, is that, in fact, what you, concerns you? Well, let me say, first of all, I don't have a particular point about the value or not value of having um, the US dollar at the center of the system. I'm just saying that descriptively, not prescriptively, um, a sudden shift in the dollar regime would be very, very destabilizing in many ways. It would be desta- destabilizing for the way that the pipes of finance globally currently work. It would be destabilizing potentially for trade relations, and it could contribute to a growing de- sense of destabilization and fragmentation in the global geopolitical order. Um, you know, the reliance on the dollar right now does create a tremendous amount of vulnerability for many non-American countries. Um, I'm not saying that's nat- necessarily a good thing or bad thing. But one way to understand what's happening in the world today, the financial system, is a bit like imagining, say, the transit net- network in Chicago. Um, anyone who's been to Chicago knows that all of the transit um, lines go out from the outside into a central hub. And then if you want to get from one end of Chicago to another end, you often have to go into the center, change, and then go out again. It's quite hard often just to go ne- between the adjacent districts. 
Um, that's in a sense a bit like what's happening with the global financial system today with a dollar and that people have to go into a dollar hub and then out again if they want to trade across much of the world. You can sit there and say that, you know, it, that's irrational. It should be more balanced. It probably should be. Um, but if you were suddenly to shift overnight, and that's essentially what some of these um, new digital currencies do, that could be a very big jolt for the system as a whole. So if nothing else, the US central bank needs to stay in that game and be simply able to respond and adapt as conditions develop. So Dante, what I'm hearing from Jillian, the, her overarching theme is that uh, the, the United States cannot be head in the sand about this because things are moving, things are moving elsewhere. And the outcomes are unpredictable, but they would be predictably not great for the United States if things go to a new innovative place and the US is not part of that. So what's your response to that overall concern? Well, I, I, I don't disagree at all that uh, hurry up and wait is not a particularly great strategy for central banks or any part of a free society to respond to the emergence of competition, geopolitical and geoeconomic realities, or the emergence of new exponential technologies. So I, I, I do think we should have some skin in the game, as uh, Jillian described it. And candidly, the whole world is waiting for the United States to lean in. There's a whole host of international bodies from the Bank for International Settlements, the Financial Action Task Force, the Financial Stability Board that have for the last five years or so waited for the United States to exhale and um, and, and demonstrate that, that we, we mean to lean in and continue to have a role to play um, in, in a lot of this evolution of money and the uploading of money on the Internet. Um, however... And, and one of the analogies I've tried to use for my friends who are um, central bank digital currency maximalist is the Federal Aviation Authority doesn't fly planes and build jet engines. However, it does have a say in terms of responsible conduct in the skies. And we're better off for having choice. And I think the skies are safer. And this is one of the debates that, that I think the, the central bank digital currency posture currently omits, which is that there is a current world in which more than $120 billion of Privately issued digital currencies known as stable coins uh, are currently circulating on a host of open public blockchain ledgers and that have increasingly uh, transmitted trillions and trillions of dollars very safely across a whole host of uh, traditional financial services sectors and active digital wallets all over the world. And to ignore that breakthrough innovation would be to borrow one of Jillian's analogies that if this is the Internet of value, it is still in its dial up phase. And, and what a lot of regulators and, frankly, what the central bank digital currency conversation is telling us is stop innovating. It would be like stopping the development of the Internet because we didn't like the dial-up phase or the worldwide wait phase. Um, and so that, that's the tension is we, we have to acknowledge the role private, responsible, regulated actors are playing and not have uh, central bank digital currencies presented as a substitute for this innovation, but perhaps as additional to it. Um, and that, that to me, is, is uh, how we land at winning the long-term stakes of a digital currency space race. Um, can I just jump in here and say I've got three things to say on that. One is that obviously where Dante is arguing from, which is Circle, which is, you know, one of the groups that actually runs essentially a private digital dollar-like currency that's backed by dollars. Um, you know, no one, Turkey's never voted for Christmas. Circle's never going to say, gee, what a great idea to have the Fed come in and displace us. Um, and that's not what I'm arguing, um, although certainly in the Chinese case, that is actually what's happened in China. The central bank has come in and displaced all of the private sector alternatives because it wants control. How, and how has, it, how has it done that? It's done that through, through legal means as well, correct? Yeah, it's basically typical Chinese, um, you know, authoritarian way. It's essentially banned Bitcoin. Um, I think it's back, banned bit, a lot of Bitcoin activities. It's banned a lot of um, alternative digital crypto activities. And it's essentially, you know, threatened Jack Ma, who created a digital fintech company, with all kinds of political issues. So, it, so it, it, it outlawed the competition to their digital exactly. currency. Exactly. Nobody is suggesting doing that, to my knowledge, within America. Um, that is not an American way. On the contrary, Jay Powell has recently indicated in a speech that he'd probably prefer the private sector, companies like Dante's, the one that Dante works for, to actually take the burden of much of the innovation. And please remind our, our listeners who Jay Powell is. Jay Powell is the chair of the Federal Reserve. So he's okay. basically like the Pope 
in the financial Vatican that goes around with all the priests, aka banks, and blessing everybody and speaking financial Latin that no one else understands. So I, I'm well aware that right now we're probably all speaking financial Latin and we're having to basically put it into back into the vernacular because otherwise we're going to end up, you know, in love with our own mysticism. So apologies yeah. for anyone who's listening. And, and, and if I if I could just building on the uh, the, the the Vatican analogy. In the papal conclave of central bankers, there is one distinction that uh, the Chinese digital currency initiative from the People's Bank of China would have over the current generation, even the private sector innovations that are currently in circulation. And that is this idea of digital legal tender, right? And today, in a world in which there's um, regulatory ambiguity in the United States, the United Kingdom, and in and other major Western countries around the world about the role of privately issued digital currencies and what type of legal certainty they enjoy um, is a world in which I think one of the clear advantages um, China has produced is this idea of conferring legal certainty and digital legal tender status on, on these individual tokens. Now, at great societal cost, um, privacy, censorship resistance, the soft expropriation of private sector actors and, and sort of competitive actors in the free market. All of those costs are very high. There's one other cost that I think matters, which is in the United States, we are woefully behind the rest of the advanced economies in what is known as real-time gross settlement. The Fed Now system is a system that was designed and is now late, so I joke that it's called Fed When. That, that was supposed to create faster intra-bank um, and interbank payment rails, uh, sort of an instant payment network. That is delayed, and oftentimes the domestic central bank digital currency conversation is hiding the void of real-time gross settlement in the U.S., for which a digital currency wouldn't necessarily be a fix because those are wholesale pipes uh, that connect the banking system to the Fed and vice versa. Well, let me jump in there because my understanding is that one of the benefits – perceived benefits of a digital dollar is that it would fix that problem, that it would it would smooth out transactions, lower transaction costs, not just for big players, but for small players and individuals as well, Dante. Well, re remember, and, and just one, one, one quick point, and I suspect Jillian and I were not going to find a lot of disagreement on this issue, is banks live on non-interest income, aka the death by a thousand cuts fees that you get for payments activities, for checking activities, anything that would be construed as a convenience inside the traditional banking space is often paid for. In the same way that with telephony, the longer the call traveled over fixed line infrastructure, the more expensive it was. And so if you want a banking outcome that is fast or convenient, you pay a premium for it. And so w one of the gaps we have in domestic payments in the United States is the lack of interoperable payment systems. And so the advent of digital currencies and public infrastructure, this blockchain digital wallet environment, is that it's creating a really, really interoperable payment system that overcomes what is known as the walled garden problem, which is that inside the environment of a PayPal, you have very efficient payments. The second you want to send a payment to an outside account, then you enter the realm of the systems are not interoperable and, and ultimately you're, you're at the mercy of a lot of fees. Um, and so presumably FedNow would have a trickle-down effect of making the intra-bank payments more efficient and then it would trickle down to the end user. But I still think you need competition for lowering fundamental costs. And that's why, again, candidly, a lot of the banking lobby is at once against central bank digital currencies, but they're also fundamentally against normalizing companies like mine who are introducing new forms of moving value in the 21st century. I mean, I jump in and say two things. Firstly, turkeys do not vote for Christmas. No bank is going to say, way, what a fabulous idea to have Circle competing with us. Um, and Circle's never going to say, way, what a fabulous idea to have the central bank competing with us. You know, that's called natural business incentives. But I think it's important to step back here and add to what Dante's saying, which is that one of the reasons why Bitcoin, why central bank digital currencies, why all of these digital assets are being discussed is because the current legacy systems are pretty rubbish in many ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bitter irony of 20th century capitalism is that many sectors of business cut out middlemen, 
became hyper-efficient and became hyper-streamlined and took out all the fees in the middle in the name of creating more capitalist efficiency. Like what, what sorts of businesses, just to cite some examples? Well, the retail world, for example. You mm-hmm. know, you know, if you think about Walmart, how do you get such cheap things on Walmart? How do you yeah. get such competition when you go online and try and buy, you know, a new sofa? It's because you mm-hmm. can see 20 different examples and you can, 20 mm-hmm. different shops and you can have competition and you can get rapid shipping, et cetera, et cetera. Finance, in many ways, has lagged way behind the only other sector that's been as almost as bad has been American healthcare, where there's been masses of middlemen essentially taking fees and very clunky pipes that money has moved along. And it's important to distinguish um, how this is actually functioning because there are two different aspects of finance. There's what we call retail finance, which is what consumers use, and there's wholesale, which is institution to institution, bank to bank. Now, The good news is that retail finance actually has become quite a bit more efficient quite often. And some of that's actually in reaction to the onset of cryptocurrencies. So what you're getting as a result of the rise of digital assets is that the traditional legacy systems in the retail sphere actually kind of is getting its act together. And there's studies of places like Singapore, where actually the ability to send money on your mobile phone has gone through the roof because suddenly all the old companies are going, yikes, We don't want to be knocked out by digital assets and competition. In the wholesale sphere, and it's very important to stress this, when you've got big banks sending each other payments across borders around the world right now, that's incredibly clunky still. And that's one reason why if you're sitting in Ohio and you want to make a payment to a friend in Delhi, it can end up taking a lot of time, a lot of cost to get that money across because the wholesale pipes are clogged up. And in fact, I was talking to the central bank governor in Brazil the other day who was telling me that the joke in Brazil used to be that if you wanted to send money from Sao Paulo to London, it was faster to get on a plane and take the money in a bag than to actually use the clunky, old-fashioned um, wholesale pipes because there hadn't been any competition before. More from Intelligence Squared US when we return. Welcome back to Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan. Let's get back to our debate. All right, so Dante, what I hear Jillian saying is that a digital dollar would allow for a great, so much more efficiency and speed that it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it makes the case almost on its own. Well, and then there is the public sector scorecard of digital transformation is checkered at best, siloed at worst, right? And so that, you know, just recently the Europeans had to pass a a law to try to get uh, the big technology companies to make sure the plugs worked and that all the peripherals for your iPhone would be conforming to a certain standard. Um, And so I do think we should be really, really candid and really honest about the point here is not one substituting the other, but that even cross-border money transmission rails, the networks that move the money, is the real breakthrough innovation. Um, Even, you know, the former Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, you know, was a little dismissive of this idea that the United States is going to lose ground and the dollar will be dethroned by a Chinese digital currency initiative unless we responded in kind, in no small measure because a digital currency is the sum of its parts. It's the sum of its institutions. And so a digital rendition of the Zimbabwean dollar would be exactly what the Zimbabwean dollar is, a hyperinflationary digital currency not worth the code it's printed on, in the same way that the physical bills would not be the paper, worth the paper they're printed on. And so that's my, my challenge, and I think what Jillian also underscores, is the breakthrough is about transmission of value in an always-on internet-native era, and in a, in a hyper-connected and globally connected global economy, we need to really contemplate rails um, because the SWIFT network, ACH networks, the credit card networks are all operating largely on technology stacks that have not had systems upgrades in quite a long time. And that's... How, how far back do those systems go? I mean, it depends on the standard, but in some cases up to 50 years or more. Uh-huh. And they're very vulnerable. Uh, they're very vulnerable pipes that are fundamentally messaging systems, not actual value transfer systems. And so things like settlement finality using traditional payment rails take a long time. And you're operating effectively in a correspondent banking network that is sending messages and payment instructions to one another, not actual money. And that's, that's the gap that we have to fill. And so I, I think of 
the the central bank example that uh, Jillian just gave of um, you know not only would getting on a plane with money instead of sending it through traditional rails trigger a suspicious activity report. Um, but in many cases and in many corridors, it is the more efficient way of moving money. And, and it's because the underlying rails, the transmission networks, um, are not interoperable. They're not internet native and they haven't had systems upgrades. And the last point I would make to Jillian's great commentary about turkeys and competition is that in most cases, we, we are at the mercy of duopolies at best. Uh, cross-border payments, it's typically one of two companies. V- credit card networks is typically one of two companies. Um, that that dominate a lion's share of uh, money movement activity. Uh, And I think that's a heck of a lot more important than the form factor of a digital currency itself or its economic backing. Again, to the essence of what a digital dollar would be, um, Jillian, the the evangelists of cryptocurrency were and are attracted to the whole concept because of the notion of decentralization of finance and anonymity and privacy – that th- th- there is no governing body overlooking the the what, what's on the blockchain, but a digital dollar created by the Fed. I, I think it's already been put out there that the Fed could literally, technically, know how everybody is spending every transaction that you make. They'll have that information. And Newsweek published a a sort of warning by um, um, an official of the Heartland Institute. And I do want to point out that the Heartland Institute is a is a uh, libertarian think tank, which has also allied itself with the tobacco companies on the question of whether smoking is bad for you. They've come down and they were arguing that it wasn't and also uh, that they question climate change. But they stated this argument very clearly in Newsweek. Digital dollars could easily be tracked by banks, federal agencies, and the Federal Reserve. They could be programmed to control the kinds of things people can buy, how much could be purchased at a single time, or any number of other variables. Okay, that does sound like conspiracy talk stuff, but it does go to, it seems, the fact that there would be uh, much less of the privacy and anonymity involved with the digital dollar than with the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And I want to ask you, is, is that a serious case to, to take on? Is it should be regarded as serious? Well, here's three points I want to make. Want to make. Firstly, the fantastic thing about this entire development and debate is that it's made people think about the underlying platforms and rails, as Dante says, on which money actually moves. And for the last 50 years, people have given it almost no thought because, let's face it, talking about logistics – Talking about financial plumbing is mind-numbingly boring normally for everybody, <laughs> anybody who's normal. I mean, you turn up at a party and say you want to talk about the rails of finance, everyone's going to fall asleep. Um, talking about money, yeah, we all love to talk about that, but not about the logistics of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and what this whole debate has done is concentrate minds on the logistics of money. And it really, really matters, partly because if the logistics are vulnerable, the whole system can, can collapse. No one thinks about plumbing in their house until suddenly there's a block block drain and a terrific stink and a mess, and then you really care about it. Um, otherwise, you ignore it. And Jillian, mix- that, is, that is your fourth fantastic metaphor in this conversation <laughs> so <laughs> far. <laughs> it's a mixed metaphor, isn't it? I'm sorry. I don't mean, but it's this, this really serious because, you know, when there is a blocked pipe, people care. And we mm-hmm. need to think about pipes right now, particularly at a time of geopolitical tension, because they could get attacked anytime soon. Point one. Mm. Point two is that the the logistics um, really matter and the plumbing really matters because, and the question of who controls it is very subtle but critical. Now, in a central bank currency, dollars, at the end of the day, it's to a large degree, not entirely, it's a large degree, it's the central bank that controls the creation of dollars. In fact, commercial banks can control them as well through lending, but let's leave that aside for the moment. Um, one of the key things that Bitcoin and other decentralized currencies do is essentially let the crowd create the money. And the only constraint on how much money is con- con- created is how fast the computers can run and whether people do or do not actually tra- trust the computer platforms. So the control is in different hands. Now, you can argue which is better or which is worse. Um, I tend to think at the moment, given how rapidly this whole system is evolving and developing, is that we need to have competition. And right now, it's no bad thing that actually, if people think, I do not trust the central bank at all, I hate the Fed, they can go off and use a Bitcoin or something like that. I do think we have to give consumers a level of choice about how much privacy they do or don't want. Most people sign up for, say, social media platforms 
even though they're sacrificing a lot of privacy because they like the convenience that is offered by those platforms. Maybe people, some people would actually say, you know what, I don't really care if the central bank has all my records on its own ledger. I actually like the idea of a digital dollar. Maybe people won't. But I think we actually should not be shutting off any options right now. We should let the market choose. Sort of in the way that, uh, another metaphor, that um, some people are, are very uncomfortable with the fact of security cameras on the street, and other people say, I don't care. And, and it, if it's keeping other, us safe, I'm okay with that. But Dante, I want to take the same question to you. I mean, J- Jillian's saying that these concerns, the concerns raised in this sort of alarmist scenario are, are laws can, you know, f- safeguards can be put in place so that the federal government, if it's issuing a digital dollar and technically would have the ability to intervene in our lives because of that, won't that's not really a really a serious concern just wanted to take your take on it yeah no well well one you know the good news is the federal reserve in its most recent paper on this topic um, reported out what is known as project hamilton which is the boston fed's particular experiment looking at the technological capabilities necessary to have um, a, a central bank digital currency and what they've said is are three things that i think should give the um those who are listening who might be afraid of the prospect, uh, some degree of comfort, right? Number one, a central bank would have to be intermediated. Um, Number two, a central bank would have to be privacy preserving, which I think opens up some serious questions about its form factor. And number three, it would have to be KYC'd. And so you can imagine KYC'd is a term of art meaning know your customer and that the the access to a central bank digital currency would have to have an individual identified and known. And so you could see a tension between number two and number three, but that ultimately means it's going to flow through the regulated financial system. Um, And so then the question becomes, then how will it produce better outcomes if it's just taking the existing rails and making them slightly more efficient? Because we Mm -hmm. have to remember the existing rails by design are competitive, by design are um, exclusive of one another. And, you know, to to build on Jillian's analogy of clogged pipes in your home, we suffered through this domestically with the advent of COVID-19 in the United States. Uh, So up until recently, I sat on FEMA's National Advisory Council and we we mobilized as a country more than $6 trillion of taxpayer-funded money to everyone. And because the money couldn't move in auditable, near real-time payment networks, we may have lost anywhere between $70 billion and $400 billion due to fraud and crimes of opportunity because there was no auditability of how money moved, or we just used completely blunt force approaches, um, sending physical checks to everybody and the, the, the payroll protection program and so on. And so that's a function of a void of rails, it's, it's a, like building a high-speed train, but not caring about the train network. And so that's the missing link in the United States. Other countries have open banking systems. Other countries and other regions like Europe have fast payment systems for intra-bank payments and mobility. But where I think we should be very concerned societally, and I think it's candidly anti-democratic, is when the central bank ultimately gets all the way down to the retail level of transaction uh, engagement and having digital wallets. And so as an example, a digital, a postal banking experiment only had six total users on it recently. Um, And so I think the boundary of where does a free society want the public sector involved in money and their financial lives are pretty clear that we just don't want these innovations at the retail level. But I'll just say to the students that, firstly, if the prospect of this digital currency puts the fear of God into the existing legacy system and makes it more efficient, that's a win-win for consumers big time. And I think the jury's allowed. It's possible that the entire crypto revolution's main impact to humankind will be to make traditional financial legacy systems dramatically more efficient, belatedly. But the other point is that I don't think we always know what consumers want because I'll give you one example, going back to my cell phone again. Um, when facial recognition technology was first mooted about a decade ago, um, most, you know, all the opinion polls showed that most American consumers were so horrified by that concept, they wanted nothing to do with it. Today, a very large chunk of our smartphones use facial recognition technology to enable us to sign on to things. And it's quite possible that we'll end up going down the Chinese route and using facial recognition technology to pay for things and to get into buildings. And the reality is that consumers' culture is shifting all the time. Culture does not exist like a plastic Tupperware box 
that you can stack up in a hierarchy of value, to use another metaphor. It's more like a slow moving river where you have new currents coming in and changing. And yes, we should all make sure the population and voters understand very clearly what's at stake in these privacy debates. But we can't necessarily assume that we know how people are going to feel in 10, 20 years time. And lastly, the very point that Dante said about how terrible the experience was of trying to dis distribute the COVID checks shows that it's not an either or. If there'd been a digital currency there, you know, that people had been using to some degree, we could have done it very, very efficiently and very quickly. But it doesn't mean that the rest of the payment systems necessarily die and wilt on the vine immediately any more th than the fact that we have credit cards means that suddenly old-fashioned cash and checks have suddenly vanished as well. I want to look at the one other word in the question that we're raising. Do we need a digital dollar? We haven't talked a little bit about who we mean by we. And we have talked to you. I'm using we in a different sense now. The three of us have talked about the term retail user has come up from time to time. And I want to I want to explore whether there are retail users who would be better off in a world with digital dollars as opposed to a system where right now you have to have a bank account and an ID card, et cetera. Um, Dante, um, I, I guess I'm asking you to, to take on a question which might actually go mm. argue against the, your no position, but maybe not. Yeah. Are there people who would be better off with the digital? Well, dollar? well, there, there are, and and I think you know one of the big fig leaves that the digital currency world and the blockchain-based finance world and the cryptocurrency world currently hides behind is this financial inclusion fig leaf, um, which is, which is the argument is very straightforward, right? That in a world in which you have 1.7 billion people with no formal access to the formal economy, for good reasons and bad, and the, the, the good ones are that if to be banked requires brick and mortar and a traditional sort of, uh, you know, retail bank access... Can, wait, then, I, I need to, I, I need to stop you because of you're using the word banked as a as a as a mm -hmm. participle, which is make, making a verb of it. So, <laughs> what do you mean by bank and unbanked? If you're a banked person versus an unbanked person, who are you? That's right. Well, it, it's the it, think of it. Well, better to better state it and maybe more crudely state it. It's to to be have margins of poverty and margins of access to the formal economy. Uh, so to be banked presumes, uh, and the FDIC produces great research on this every year, to be banked presumes you have access to a series of formal banking and financial services um, from low-cost che check cashing to low-cost uh, checking account access and to, over time, things that can accrue credit to you and lending and so on. So, that, so that's like the, the very simplistic definition of what does it mean to be banked. But then you have, and the COVID example is really uh, dispositive, you have rural populations that were told on the one hand by the uh, CDC and others to quarantine and stay at home, to then get a physical check that they would then have to go cash somewhere physically. They didn't just get an asset, they got a liability because that liability ultimately needed to go to a physical location in order to get cashed. And so the advent of digital currencies, private digital currencies, and faster payment systems starts to remove some of the logistics, again, borrowing uh, Jillian's, I think, great terminology, for how money moves and how it reaches end users. And so that's like one big problem set. We have a planet with an enormous number of people who are um, perennially on the margins of the formal economy. Advantaged now how in a digital currency? They would be advantaged simply by the same way, and this is where it, it perhaps is too simplistic, but in the same way that if to have access to telephony hinged on antiquated fixed line infrastructure, you would have billions and billions of people all over the world who wouldn't enjoy the revolution of mobile telephony and now mobile internet. And so this is where this is a Cambrian explosion of innovation in banking and payments and finance is that armed with little more than an internet-connected device, a smartphone, a basic phone, a basic Android phone, that device can now become a compliant payment endpoint. And that's where this revolution is really starting to take on uh, pretty big societal proportions. Something like 75% of all the merchants in the world are contemplating accepting digital currencies as a part of their retail payment experience. And so that, that's a pretty big flywheel that analogizes very closely to mobile money 
Yeah. And the mobile money experience we've seen in regions in, in Africa and countries like Kenya. But as the, um, as the debater taking the no side in this argument, you've you said that every, all these benefits you just explained are something of a fig leaf. No. Well, so he, he, the fig leaf is that the only actor in an economy that can deliver those social impacts uh, are the the public authorities is is the the thing I'm railing against right that because uh-huh. one of the arguments for central bank digital currencies is that you could have better forms of social uh, money helicopter money and had we had it during COVID this Fed could have magically parachuted funds directly to the end user. All right, well, Dante and Jillian, thank you so much. You 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 helped us get through this with uh, with the with the with help of many metaphors and analogies <laughs> and numerous references to plumbing and rails. Um, but I. I think it helped make some of this abstract uh, material concrete for us. So I want to thank you both for for helping us figure out, do we need a digital dollar, yes or no? So Dante, Jillian, thank you so much for joining us at Intelligence Squared. Thank you. Thank you, John. And for now, I'm John Donvan, and we will see you next time. The conversation you just heard is just a great example of why we do these debates. Um, to hear two people who disagree do so uh, civilly, uh, even to the point where uh, they meaningfully agreed where, where that was useful and helpful to all of us understanding what this complex issue is about. And uh, also, we appreciated their predictions of the future, which we can check back on in the future. And we hope you are there with us when that happens. For now, I'm John Donben. This is Intelligence Squared, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Intelligence Squared, made possible by a generous grant from the Laura and Gary Lauder Venture Philanthropy Fund. As a nonprofit, our work to combat extreme polarization through civil and respectful debate is generously funded by listeners like you, the Rosencrantz Foundation, and friends of Intelligence Squared. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman, Clea Connor is CEO, David Ariosto is head of editorial. Julia Melfi, Shea O'Mara, and Marlette Sandoval are our producers. Damon Whittemore is our radio producer. And I'm your host, John Donvan. We'll see you next time. <laughs>